Hi, welcome to the Coffee Chat Show here on Buzzing Pattaya, the show where we talk about things that are happening right here, right now, as well as general news, tips, information and advice. Now, joining me on the show today is Dave from Canterbury Tales Bookshop. How are you doing, my man? I'm fine, Trevor. Thank you. Good to see yeah, you. Good welcome to, see you. to everybody. Thank you very much. Now, I thought I'd have a little change of scenery. I mean, you're a bit of a hot topic, you are. Like, Am so I? many people have been saying to me, go and see Dave at Canterbury Tales. Have a chat with him. Right, right, right. So, right. here you are. You've asked for Dave and we got him. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've been open all the way through the pandemic so people come in for a coffee people come in for a book so it's a good little meeting place i have to say mate it's very busy sure it's very busy now before we get into the the nuts and bolts of what it is you do here right i mean tell me a bit about yourself though i mean i mean originally where are you from i'm from canterbury in kent um i came here the first time ever in the millennium year 2000 and um, I came with a friend of mine and I'd only ever had a family holiday before that. Yeah. And then I got, I'd been divorced and a fella had been out here and he brought me out here in the millennium year. Yeah. And so it was quite, um, quite you know, memorial. Yeah, and better than I hope. Nothing can be to here. So. And I, I, as I say, I'd just been to, I'd just taken my daughter to Florida for oh, the millennium nice. for the second time yeah and then all of a sudden i had a guy's holiday and and it was good yeah it was great fun he really enjoyed it so know. back in canterbury i mean what were you doing back home i well i i left school at 15 and i became a gamekeeper wow um, you got I'd no been, guns hidden anywhere have you? No, right. <laughs> you know, I've, been doing, yeah, I've been doing that for years anyway as a child you know i yeah. started off birds egging and met the old gamekeeper and he used to clip us around a year old and all that and and, I, and he got me interested in it, and um, then I just transitioned into a gamekeeper instead of a bird's egg collector. Um, left school at 15, worked on the same place for a few years, then Eastwell Park, then Shropshire, Wiltshire, Sussex. Wow. So all over the place, yeah. So um, I have to ask a question. I mean, you're there with your double barrel, you're walking around. Did you ever catch any poachers? Oh, you, God, you know. Did you ever, uh, ever uh, pop a few caps in their arse? Hey, the, Trevor, there's a, book, there's a book there, mate, with all my memoirs about that. There's a few books here yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, probably the best one, I had a bit of a fling with a with a lady called Margaret Taylor Sutton. Oh, right. And she was very ear <laughs> hillier. And um, she she got pregnant right. over a bloody pheasant. She said, could you get me a pheasant? Anyway, I got her a pheasant. Hang on, I've got to interrupt you. Go on. You got her pregnant over a pheasant. How yes. did that work? Well, she asked me if I could get her a pheasant. She yeah. had a wonderful, she said she had a menu, uh, sorry, a, a um, recipe for a pheasant roast. Yeah. And, she, and I gave her a pheasant and she said, oh, you'll have to come and have some. <laughs> And the rest is history, and we got she got bloody pregnant, but she was she was a bit nuts. Yeah. And I buggered off. It was the hurricane year, 1987, and she got pregnant. I buggered off to Shropshire. Yeah. And my daughter, who was then born, I went to see her when she was a little baby, but then I never saw her for 22 years. Wow. And she found me here. Wow. And came here. And now you and your daughter are connected? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. She's a, she's a teacher in, in London, in Wimbledon. In Wimbledon? Yeah. Wow. And so my other daughter has four children, but um, she lives in Dover. And they've all been out here, you know, yeah. they come out here whenever I can, whenever I pay for it, basically. So you were the gamekeeper, like, were you her bit of rough? I certainly was. was I was yeah. a down-to-earth <laughs> gamekeeper, basically, and she'd, um, she'd come from London somewhere and wanted to find herself. She wanted to know all about leaves and birds and trees and and she pestered the life out of me and I you know she was older than me and anyway we, we had a cut the bottles of wine in a pheasant and you know how it goes Lady Chatterley and all that <laughs> well and, there you go uh, guys get yourselves a pheasant if you're back yeah, in England yeah, right. you're in with a chance <laughs> but yeah poachers there was lots and lots of occasions because back then I'm going back a long time yeah and um you know, back then the police weren't interested. There was no mobile phones, there was no internet. Yeah. You just went out and looked for poachers, and if they were there, you tried to catch them. You know, and and whatever. But yeah, lots and lots of incidents. So you um, you've let a few caps off in your time, then Bob Bob. Let's oh yeah, it. I mean we used to, you know, we used to catch <laughs> gypsies long dogging for for hares and rabbits and what have you, and we used to find their vans because they wouldn't walk as far as to the estate. Yeah. So we'd find their vehicle and we'd put that out of action. You know, we'd um, so they couldn't ride off. Yeah, we'd let the tires down, or, or worse, <laughs> or put a barrel through the radiator, or whatever. But anyway, but back then, I'm going back a long time, so that, you know, you wouldn't get away with it nowadays. Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, but the police weren't interested. The police would just, you know, get on with it, sort of thing. Um, but then, I, yeah, as I say, I moved around. I ended up back in um, 
back in Kent um, and then packed it all in and a couple of three years went by. I, I then um, I started doing work with deaf and disabled when I packed in gamekeeping because I didn't know what to do after yeah. 30 years odd of that. Yeah. And then I started, um, I met up with, we, we had a, an open day at the post office, the deaf and disabled place. And the Samaritans was next door. Okay. And I met the, uh, the director, Elizabeth, lovely lady, and she told me all about the Samaritans. Cut a long story short, I joined. I then started helping with the listener scheme in the prisons on the Isle of Sheppey. Right. And I ran the listener scheme for four or five years. And then, then I came here and eventually came to live here. But, yeah. Um, so I was in and out of the prisons. Um, lots of things happened. Um, lots and lots of things which are going to be in my book. Yeah, well, we'll talk about your book as well in part two because obviously right. that relates okay. to the book, yeah, yeah, bookshop yeah. here. I mean, so what's the biggest stately home then, I'm guessing, or mansion that you've uh, you've been a gamekeeper? Because, I mean, right. you know, I watch Emmerdale, so I see, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> don't know, that's my go-to program. We used to watch <laughs> Seth, so we used to know what to do. There. Seth Armstrong, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, no, I you worked, know, um, what's the biggest one? I worked at Glastonbury Park in, in Geldhurst. Not right. Glastonbury, Glastonbury, that was a nice uh, little estate with a manor house and so on. Um, before that I worked at Eastwell Park in Ashford. Right. There was a big manor house there, they eventually sold that to a Canadian consortium who made a hotel out of it. Yeah. Um, in the Kent countryside. I went to Spy Park in Wiltshire. Right. Um, Captain Spicer owned it, very, very lovely old man, he was very old, ex-army guy. He had two sons, one, one yeah. I won't say his name just in case, but he was his one son was a real ass, oh, right. <laughs> a, an absolute ass, and the other the other son was very very nice. I got on with him, but I ended up having to sort of um, tell his father what he was up to because right. you know, he was in the main drives of the pheasants and so on. Anyway, um, I then went to Downton Park in Shropshire. And, and a French woman had bought an estate up there and wanted to develop it into a pheasant shoot. And, wow. Um, so yeah, that was great fun. Then I moved back down to Kent. Um, and marriage went up, up, you know, down the toilet. Yeah. And um, basically that was a slut start of my slide into packing it all in. Right. I mean, I want to ask you a question because I'm from London. So like right. when you see these, we call them rooty toots, you know what I mean? Like they've got these big posh ads. Yep. But we call them Ruperts. Right. Do, do you, is that your terminology for them? Or, Not I mean, obviously, really. like. We used to, we, you know. <laughs> we How now, used, Rupert? We would call it, you know, to us, they were the gentry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, some of the old gentry, the old school shooting guys, were very nice. Yeah. Uh, one or two was absolute arses. Uh, 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 Captain, uh, sorry, uh, Lord Spence was one in particular down in Sussex who used to come shooting on the estate where I was keepering and he he was involved in that Guinness thing. Remember the Guinness affair? Oh, I don't know. Right, Sorry. well, he, 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 look, look it up. It was all very political at the time. Okay. A long time ago. And we was hoping he was going to get banged up, you know, because <laughs> he was an arse. He used to come, he was on the one of the syndicate shooting, but he would also come on the, the beaters days, which is where the beaters and the keepers would have a bit of fun and shoot a few feathers. Oh, he yeah, wanted yeah. to come, you know, and yeah. so on. So, um, we didn't like him, yeah. and, and, and he was a, near, a real ass. But most of them, a lot of them, were the old gentry were real, very gentlemen. They really? were very oh, nice. Oh, fair play. And did they yeah. wear like all those cropped, uh, oh, of course. all real, the full real, regalia? I have photos of me in all my shooting suits. Did you have suits. to wear it? Oh yeah, <laughs> God, yeah, I've got loads of photos. Oh, and, brilliant. Uh, we had Captain Mark Phillips came shooting. Yeah. Um, Susie Quattro. Did you? She used to come shooting at Eastwell Park. Captain Mark Phillips. Um, I had a bet with two other of the loader guys because we'd load on double gun days. Yeah. They'd have double guns. And um, uh, I had a bet with two of the other guys that I would, sorry, three of them, 20 quid each, that I would ask him how his mother-in-law is. And, and I did, and of course some of the other guys, oh God, you know, but oh, I won dear. 60 quid on asking him how his mother-in-law was. But he was fine, he was fine. He was. He enjoyed the day, he was a good shot, yeah. he, he was a gentleman and, and so on. His his loader, however, was an ex-army guy, he was a bit of an ass. Right. Because he thought I was taking the mickey when I asked him about the mother-in-law. Yeah. Michael. But I was just having a bit of a joke. Brilliant. And, and so on. But yeah. Brilliant. So, 
from from obviously walking around and uh, you know the po hunting down poachers and stuff. I mean, when was your first trip out here? Was it 2000? You said. Yeah, I came out here in the millennium year 2000. Um, it was basically a, a, I'd met a guy in Canterbury. He'd just been here, and I thought well, you know he told me all about it. Sounded. Yeah right up my street if yeah. you like because you know, yeah. I'd only ever had family holidays as I say yeah and we came here for about eight or nine days yeah I was in tears going back to that <laughs> airport honest to god I'd finally you know I'd, I've done something for myself yeah, yeah I was a good age as well yeah. obviously 20 years ago this yeah. was 21 years um, so I was a good age and I never drank at the time okay I uh, never smoked and all that but I enjoyed certain I certainly enjoyed the food and of course was pretty taken back with the nightlife yeah of course and yeah. we we went back and then i said oh, you know we've got to have some more of that so we booked yeah. for a month about about two weeks later we were back for a month so i was getting into trouble for my daughter was giving me earache you know and so on dad what are you doing well yeah that's <laughs> right and then it, and, and then she's younger than me <laughs> i then met a um i was taking a girl to the brompton hospital in london whose son had a hole in the heart yeah and we, I was taking this girl called Zoe to see her son, and I was, and Matthew, I'd see him as well. Yeah. And and I bumped in, I sort of met a Thai nurse, and okay. she, and, and lived with me in Canterbury for two and a half years, and wow. then we came to Thailand to live, but she, because of her visa, she either had to stay in forever, or go back. And of course, the opportunity for her to go back and become, carry on nursing was much better than, because I didn't know what I was going to do. I was only here for a year then. Mm. And of course, since that year, which was, uh, you know, uh, 2003, I've been back to England once only. Wow. And so that's what, when my father passed away. Right. Six understand, years ago. I understand. So, so when you came over here, you were already in a committed relationship then when you came here to live? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She came to live. She came yeah. to live with me. We lived in Minbury in Bangkok. The plan was just for a year. Okay. But I was sort of determined to give it a go if I could, if I could stay here. And I'd done some voluntary teaching in Bangkok, uh, Klang Long Song School, and great fun. You get to know a lot about the culture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I met some nice, normal Thai people and so on. Made some nice, good friends. Yeah. And I still talk to them, you know. Um, and, and then, um, coming towards the end of the year, I had a decision to make. Obviously, I couldn't afford to become a voluntary teacher for the rest of my life. I yeah. needed to earn a living. So, and I didn't particularly want to come to Pattaya because of the obvious, but it was certainly somewhere for a business. Mm. And we opened Canterbury Tales Cafe over there. Oh, okay, right, because uh, we're in Soy Pothole now, Soy yeah. 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 And um, because it was, you know, I used to sit here and wander around and people would be queuing up to go into Crazy Dave. So yeah. I knew there was a bit of a niche market there. I understood. Um, and then we opened over there, renovated all the building, the rooms and everything else. Then this came available about a year later, went double the size. Mm. Obvious good idea to move over here, which we did. And, and we're still here. And, and the, the bookshop at the time was very, very, very small, mm. but it's just developed and grown and grown and grown. Okay. It? I mean, you mentioned earlier there that you lived in Bangkok for a year. I yeah. mean, what's it like to live in Bangkok <laughs> as opposed to living here? I mean, is there a huge difference? Well, it's not too bad because I lived in Minbury, northeast of the city. Yeah. So out there, it was fine. It was quiet. You know, you could get around. It was normal Thai people it was, yeah. wasn't any nightlife out there you know I used to go into Nana and yeah, whatever yeah. you and have a drink with the lads and yeah. whatever but um, it wasn't too bad but the city itself to travel around was a nightmare was it yeah it was a bloody nightmare BTS the traffic, and traffic and yeah I mean the, the sky train wasn't as developed then as it was now it okay. is now um, now the sky train is a, is a way to go in Bangkok if mm. you're just visiting for a tourist thing you know yeah um, morning. morning, but anyway, um, it was it was hard work. I mean, my mum and dad came over. I wanted to take them to dinner at the uh, the place at Good Food, and they'd done the Thai dancing. It took yeah. us two hours to get there across Bangkok, wow. and it was just a bloody nightmare. So, um, and I didn't fancy, you know, opening a business up a business up mm. in Bangkok. So. Pattaya was the obvious choice because everything's 10 minutes away. Yeah, you sure. Know, from, yeah. from here, for example, you know, you're, you're every, everywhere the beach and Jom Tien, Nuklua, mm -hmm. everywhere's 10 minutes away. So, so you've experienced something that a lot haven't then because you've experienced Don Mawang Airport. 
<laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> See his, ho his whole soul just draining. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. The first the time. The propellers. <laughs> and, and yeah, and of course, coming out of the airport and thought somebody left the bloody oven door open, <laughs> you know. It was Thank you for saying that. Fuming. Thank yeah, you for sure. saying that. I say this to the guys watching. You know, it, it was always the thing, wasn't it? You'd come down the steps sure. off the aeroplane and you think, oh, get out of these, where these turbines. God, dear. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you yeah. keep walking across the car and think, sure. the plane's like 600 meters over there yeah, now. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm roasting because it really was awful, yeah, wasn't absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But a great experience, nevertheless. And, mm. um, you know, obviously the nightlife was, was an eye opener. I, I never drank at that time, and, and you know, because I did. I did do a bit of taxi driving in between other things. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it'll all be in my book, actually, because yeah. there's, a, there's a lot to the story. But um, so I never drank. I, you know, I didn't smoke or anything like that. So um, we still enjoyed ourselves immensely. You didn't need to get drunk, and in fact, it spoils it when you get too drunk anyway. Yeah. And we did enjoy it. We go around the around the bars and all the nightlife. It was great fun, but. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't overly uh, again it'll be in the book but what wasn't overly I didn't come out here for the nightlife sure because as I say I didn't well you were in the a relationship weren't you yeah I was in a relationship and all that as well and um, and it was a sort of shame but I met when she went home I met the lady I'm with now I've been married to her for 14 years maybe yeah. 15 years yeah wow. she's at home and she was related to the teaching I was doing in Bangkok yeah and we got on very well and you know I, I thought if I'm going to start a business it's as well to have a Thai partner as of course to, yeah as opposed to just a manager because you know what uh, things can happen so when you came here to live all those years ago I mean what were the hardest things to adapt to from coming from like obviously a gamekeeping environment to living out in the open you know fresh air what was the hardest thing for you to adapt to yeah I mean I, I thought the first thing would be difficult would be the heat mm -hmm. um, and I purposely you know used to wander around in Bangkok doing a bit of sightseeing and bits and pieces I mean we traveled a lot when when we first came we went to Chiang Mai she was from Chiang Mai yeah and all over Thailand and I remember coming through Walking Street the wrong way driving and a policeman at the end and I thought Thank oh you. no here we go yeah of course and my, my wife at the time she said uh, something to him and he said okay you know but you know, no, that was a, a lovely You mean you I got just, away with no yeah, teapot yeah, contribution? Yeah, I just pleaded ignorant. I just went, I don't God know where I'm bloody dear. going. See, that's a rarity. Who who else gets away with no teapot funds? Well, there you go. I mean, that's incredible. Oh, it's that, I've, I've been, you know, I've had it since, of yeah, course. Yeah. But, I think we all um, have. Yeah. But no, it's... Uh, it, so the heat and anything else? I mean, how did you get on with the language barrier? Um, the language barrier has yes, always been tricky, really. You, you sort of try and learn a bit. My, my aim was the first year because I thought I'd only be here a year. I thought I'd do a, I'd do a course at some university yeah. and at least learn a good lump of the language so that when I come back, I can keep practicing. But I never did that. I right. tried to cut corners with the, with the, with the teaching. Yeah. But there was like 500 kids and 20 odd teachers and, and no way it was going to be teaching me English. I was teaching them Thai, but it was great fun. Yeah. I was doing two, three days a week teaching. So you know what Ben Crew, Ben Crew. You yeah, well, you learn a lot, you know. Yeah. Crew Dave, Crew Dave. Yeah, 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 Mr. Teacher. But um, and then the food, of course. I um, I would eat at the school, and of course I would just, you know, be brave, and they'd give me a bowl of God knows what it was, and, <laughs> and I would suck it off the spoon and nearly die with it where it hit the windpipe. You know, I mean, it, um, that happened more than once. But um, I bet the kids were all laughing. Yeah, yeah of course. Give it, give it to sir. Give it to sir. We've done, we done a trip to Safari World and and the other place where there's a snow dome, and they lured me in there and blasted me with snowballs. And kids, but yeah, it was great fun. Brilliant. And I mean, fun, when you, know. you come here to Patea, I mean. Can you remember what it was like back in the day for the entertainment? I mean, where were the go-to places for you when you well, were when, here? Well, in the earlier days, there was there was sort of a couple of soys, you know, 13-2 or whatever. Yeah, 13 uh, But two. most of it was Walking Street. Yeah. Um, that was the place, you know, anywhere you would go, you would end up in Walking Street because yeah. that's the hub of it, or was the hub of it then. And of course, over the years, you know, this area, this is why I chose this area, mm. because I could see it was growing. And, Definitely, um, yeah. yeah. You know, we, we, the first time I came in the millennium year, we stayed in the in-town holiday hotel okay. in Soy Honey. Oh, and okay. we walked up to Soy Brokel just here, and we walked down the middle of the road. There was nothing. There was no wow. traffic at all. Now, even in the pandemic, you can't do that. Yeah. You know, certain times it's quiet at the moment, but um, this area was certainly growing, and that's why I chose this area. Yeah, I mean, Walking Street, I mean, you know, we, we, 
been talking talking to death about Walking Street, obviously, because of the, sure. the possibility of the demise of what made this city so famous. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I, what what is your thoughts on it? I mean, for me personally, I, I can see there being a, a large element of changes going on in Walking Street, but I think that whatever they take out of Walking Street can easily find its home over here. So well, they've started what to do, do think that. What do you think happened? A lot, of, a lot of places have started to move this way. Mm. There's one or two bars in LK Metro now that they either still have at the moment or, or did have a, a, a bar in Walking Street yeah, and yeah. they realise what's going on and there's plenty of scope up here and, and I think it's probably if the plans I've seen about, about Walking Street go ahead to make it all nicey-nicey touristy and all that it will only enhance Patea mm. and there's plenty of scope up this way you know, I mean, LK Metro and the whole area Cyber Cow and all the little offshoots there's plenty of space for the same sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, Tree nighttime. Town's very popular, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Town. absolutely. Beautiful at night time when and, it's all open. It, you know, the Metro's sort of full up with bars now, and, it, you know, when it all opens again, it'll all start to liven up again. And lights of Tree Town, and all along Cyber Cow. Mm. Mm. Go back 10 years, there'd be hardly any bars, and maybe yeah. a few people sitting in them now. People like to sit along the Cyber Cow, watch the people mm. going by and all that. And it's it's a busy area. I and must this, admit, where you are here, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is lovely. You know, you're sitting sure. here, you've got the shade, you've got the, the fans yeah. going on, you know, you can watch people coming up and down. I mean, it really is a lovely and little go-to We, have, go a, to we have a lot of entertainment, you know, across the road. <laughs> is that your gamekeeper's accent? It certainly is. <laughs> How now, get, brown cow? They get up to some disgusting things across See, the road. you're there. being a Rupert now, aren't I you? I am, I am. And uh, we, we, we quite often time guys, who go in there and give them a round of applause if they last more than 15 minutes. And so, sometimes they run off down the road so <laughs> bloody embarrassed, it's untrue. But well, yeah, I must admit, I mean, if you, I mean, we are in uh, Soy Pot, Pothole and yes. uh, obviously it's notoriously, there are a lot of massage places here. So I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, if, I, if you, I mean, you're opposite Umbar and the other ones here, I mean, I guess if someone walks out and there's you lot sat here, give them a round of applause, it, it's yeah, pretty I mean, intimidating. We, we, it's quite unique <laughs> to have a bookshop it's a, you know, I always envisage uh, Hemingway sitting here looking across the road. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's quite unique a bookshop in a soil like this because everything else is bars. There's a couple yeah. of restaurants. Yeah. Um, but. Um, well, we'll talk about why you decided to open the bookshop in part two because okay. you know you haven't just opened the bookshop; you've got the well, bookshop. Well, I think all oh, that's you've disgusting, the... you know. <laughs> anyway, but yes. Um, hey, see, okay. See this Rupert routine? It I don't know, suit yeah. you. You know, you got to get We've a bit better clubber than that, don't you? Yeah, we have a good laugh. We do. Some I of mean, the characters. You know. I mean, in terms of Patea now, I mean, we're talking about Walking Street, etc. I mean, I want to bring this this part of the interview to a close. But in terms of before we close. Where do you see the future of Patio? I mean, what, what do you think the outcome is going to well, be? Well, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of people saying, you know, I don't agree with what I read a lot about, oh, it's going to take years to get back to normal. I mean, I, I get messages, I know a lot of guys over the years, I get messages daily. When mm. can I get there? When can I come? Yeah, you know, yeah. Do you know this? And, and all over the net, people are asking the same thing. So guys are gagging to get here. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great place, a climate, a nightlife, and so on. Um, so... I, you know, it's going to take a time, of course, but once they get every, they start banging the vaccinations out here, mm. and then everybody in the UK will have had them by then. Yes. And once yeah. the flight starts, once it starts up, I think it will be absolutely crazy. Mm. I think there'll be a lot of guys want to get back out here. Um, you know, it's even picked up with the people who've done the quarantine. I've got guys staying here now who've done the quarantine. Yeah. So I think it will pick up. It might be slow. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying I know any more than anybody else because I don't. But I. I think certainly once it all opens up again, Patea will will come back in its own. Mm. And all these bars and places that will shut, people will open them again. And I mean, I know bars have opened through the pandemic. Yeah. You and know, I even think even in this soy, bars have opened in this soy through the pandemic. I think you said it there, and, and it's, a, it's a very valid point, that as a door closes, another one opens. Yep, absolutely, you know, and there absolutely. are people around here sure. you know, that are always looking for other opportunities. And yep. like you say, I, I agree with you. You know, I think, Dave, to be fair, we are going to go through a transition period, of course. That's, that's going to happen. And we are going to suffer some changes in casualties in Walking Street. But when we say casualties, I think, not a casualty as in that's it, they've gone. I think it's, well, they're not going to be there now. They're going to up sticks and, and come over this side. Sure, I, I think that's so, where it's yeah, going to be. Yeah. And I, Brilliant. And some are already doing that. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you go around the metro now, there's a couple being renovated, um, big piles of concrete. So they're spending money on them, you know, and they're not doing that on a whim. Mm. You know, they, they know that once it starts to get back to busy again, they'll be, they'll be very busy. And, yeah. so, and I think it was... 
I think something to do with the Sapphire in Walking Street yes. bar. They they've made put money into up here into the metro and they're opening yeah, to something Lady Love. there. So yeah. 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 So you know it's all it's all starting to happen. Yeah. And you know, I can I mean maybe this will end up Canterbury Tells a go go, you never know. <laughs> But what no, do you mean? Uh, you got to sit in the go-go, flick through the book. Yeah, oh, this is good. I like this. Hey, look but at that. No, book. I mean, I've had, you know, I had an offer um, two years ago. Yeah. This place. Right. Because of the way Metro was getting very expensive. Yeah. For rents and so on. Yeah. And this is a double shop house. The only problem with this place, but a little bit, we we get a little bit flooded when it rains badly. That's why. Still the, the roads flood here? Never. Yeah. <laughs> That's why the books are all off the ground. But. <laughs> It does Brilliant. deter people a little bit, but the Brilliant. triangle bar does very well. You Brilliant. Know. So, uh, well, listen, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your, right, your history. Trip, no do problem. we do we end this in a rooty toot voice, or do we, we just keep it normal? Do. Oh, yeah. Well, that's it from us here My today. And I. We would like to gracefully thank you for your presence on such a wonderful show. Yes, indeed. Yeah, we, we've been there. Listen, uh, that's look, it from us. We're look forward to seeing myself <laughs> making a complete kit of myself but anyway <laughs> my friend it's been brilliant thank nice you so time, much nice indeed time, nice time. guys there you go that's it Dave from Canterbury Books uh, here down in Soy Pothole Soy Chaipum come down and say hello Monday, Wednesday, Friday he's here he's a great guy he's got a huge amount of experience and in part two look at all the books behind me there's thousands of them so uh, you know if you are stuck for things you like to sit on your balcony with a cup of coffee and read a book well we know the place to go so we're going to come back on Friday and if you'd like to count them before you go feel free uh, did I say I've got somewhere else to go? Yes. <laughs> All right, that's it from us, guys. Thank you so much for watching. As always, please remember to hit the subscribe button and also the bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we bring out a new video. Guys, check out our members area. More and more people are joining each and every week, and there's loads of participating places here in the city centre that will offer you discounts. And join our Telegram group. There's more than, uh, I think it's 1,300 people now uh, that are on the Telegram group, like-minded people just like you guys that love this wonderful city and uh, all talk about all kinds of weird and wonderful things check it out guys all right that's it from us thank you so much for watching and please wherever you are in the world stay safe